Welcome and thank you for joining us on Birth Mother Matters in Adoption with Kelly Rourke Scary and me, Ron Rains, where we delve into the issues of adoption from every angle of the adoption triad. Do what's best for your kid and for yourself because if you can't take care of yourself, you're definitely not going to be able to take care of that kid and that's not fair. And I know that my daughter will be well taken care of with them. Don't have an abortion. Give this child a chance. All I could think about was needing to save my son. My name is Kelly Rourke Scary. I am the executive director, president, and co-founder of Building Arizona Families Adoption Agency, the Donna K. Evans Foundation, and creator of the You Before Me campaign. I have a bachelor's degree in family studies and human development and a master's degree in education with an emphasis in school counseling. I was adopted at the age of three days, born to a teen birth mother, raised in a closed adoption and reunited with my birth mother in 2007. I have worked in the adoption field for over 15 years. And I'm Ron Raines. I've worked in radio since 1999. I was the co-host of two successful morning shows in Prescott, Arizona. Now I work for my wife, who's an adoption attorney, and I'm able to combine these two great passions and share them on this podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure to rate and review us on whatever platform you use to listen to us and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Look for AZ Adopt Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about my story in adoption reunification. And the reason that I have decided to take an episode and really talk more about my story and and go in depth is I have found that when I am talking with birth moms, when they walk into the office and they meet me as the adoption agency director, you know, they look at me as somebody who is, you know, got a lot of titles behind her name and, you know, is not relatable, you know, middle-class educated, you know, not just not relatable. And when I explained to them my story and that I was adopted and where I came from Mm -hmm. and I'm no different than they are. I was placed for adoption and given opportunities that my biological brothers weren't given because they were not placed for adoption. That, And I start showing them a picture that I have of my mom. Then they're able to form a connection. So in taking that a step further, I created a, a book of my childhood and my mom and my story and my brother's childhood and then their story. And I just did it through pictures that I had collected. And in doing this, I thought I'm gonna take this with me so when I meet with moms, I can show them really the, the difference of the life that I lived versus the, the life that my brothers lived. And it, it wasn't that my mom wasn't a good mom, she was an amazing mom. Hmm. And her adoption choice for me was the best choice she could have possibly made. But my brothers weren't given the opportunities that I was given. And so there was no reason or need for her to feel sad or have regrets or anything about her adoption choice, which she did because of the manner that it was handled in and the fact that she had no support. And so when I was 34 years old, I started to look for my birth mother. And one of the reasons that I started to look for her is my two-year-old at the time had been diagnosed with a a heart murmur. And I started thinking like, I have no medical history at all. And, you know, with my daughter, who it turned out luckily just to be a normal childhood heart murmur that she grew out of, um, at the time, I didn't know that. Like we we were still undergoing tests and so forth. And when I made the decision, like I I need to do, I need to, you know, find my heritage, who I am. At that point, um, I also had been in the adoption world for a couple, for two years, and I had started meeting birth moms. And so again, I started becoming very interested in what I was seeing and what I was learning. And I, I was thinking that you know my mother is out there, my biological mother is is out there, and I want to find out you know more about her. And when I started the journey, I was hesitant to talk to my adoptive family about it because I was really afraid that I was going to hurt their feelings or make them feel like they weren't good enough. So I had to find my biological mother because they weren't enough, but they were enough. That wasn't what it is. 
it was, there was a piece of me that was missing and I needed to find that piece. And I need to find it because I wanted to find out who I was. I wanted to find out who my biological mother was. And I really wanted to learn as much as I could about our family medical history. So I was born in the state of Ohio and I went to my adoptive family um, who reside now in, in California and asked them for all the information that they had. And as I've talked about in previous episodes, they told me that she was 16 when she delivered. It was a private adoption. Uh, they gave me the name of the attorney. They said that she had just found out that she was pregnant, that she uh, was from a very large family, and that she liked, as we've talked about, physical education at school, which is the furthest thing from the truth. Right. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was a lot of things, and an athlete was not one of them. And so going off of that information and the fact that it was a closed adoption, I had to petition the court and ask them if they would open the adoption. And that would have meant that my mother would have had to fill out a form that says that um, they could release her information if I ever chose to reach out to them. Mm -hmm. And there was a possibility. I think the, the court said that 20 had applied that month and eight of them had come back and I was one of eight. And so this was the paper that my mother had, I'm showing you, I know our listeners can't see it, right, but this is the right. paper that my mother had uh, gone in and filled out. And she actually went in and filled out the authorization for release. And she put her phone number and uh, she wrote, you know, all over it, which was really sweet. Um, and then she, she put to her, if she finds this, I've never stopped thinking about you. And so that was really sweet. Right. Uh, she, she did this in, so I was born in 73 mm -hmm. and she did this in 96. So she, I was 23 about when she did this. Right. And um, ironically, I just noticed for the first time in looking at this, she did it uh, the day before my birthday. So, oh, I'm sure it was on her heart. Wow, that's yeah. that's kind of neat. It is very sweet. Yes. So when the the court had said yes, they opened up the file. So when they opened it up initially, I also received the information about my birth mother and birth father, and uh, and then you also get the uh, copy of your original birth certificate, which my mother didn't name me. So I was just baby girl. And then her last name Evans, which, um, but in the information that is listed, uh, the release of non-identifying adoption information, it's, it's kind of fun to read, um, because she does list the, the birth father, even though he's not on the birth certificate. And I think she may have just Maybe possibly made this up. I don't know. <laughs> now, I'm know. curious because I fill out a lot of these uh, non-identifying forms now for birth mothers and, and the birth fathers as well. Is it very similar to yes. what I'm filling out yes, from back is. in those it's, days? It states um, age at your birth, uh, meaning the babies, the year of birth, nationality and race, religion, school grade completed. Uh, marital status, height, weight, hair color, eye color, and complexion. Okay. That's so it. that's actually kind of along the same lines, but ours is the ones we fill out for building Arizona family are very comprehensive. Right. I mean, They're a much lot more of information. Depth than they were. Okay. Yes. yes, they were definitely much more. And I bet and, you would have liked to have had that from back in 73. You know? Oh, absolutely. That's absolutely. And it was, it was, fascinating because the court was a two-step process. Um, you had to petition to open the court, they approved it, and then they went and they searched the file and they found it. So at that point, I had hired a private detective to help me, you know, start locating her. She had been married four times, so her name had continually changed. So mm -hmm. it took a little bit of time. And what I had done um, is I actually found her first, <laughs> even before the private investigator did. Um, and I found her on a, it was a Friday night. One of our workers at Building Arizona Families actually helped me at the very end find her mm -hmm. and made the phone call and came over to the house when we actually made the very, very first phone call. 
And what's, what's really neat is as I was preparing for this podcast, I went through and found the notes that she and I were writing to each other as wow. she was on the phone with, um, cause she spoke to my biological mom first and then handed me the phone uh-huh. and I'm looking at the notes and it's saying things like I'm freaking out. Um, you know what she asked what my maiden name was. So I'm writing it to her so my friend can tell her right. and, it was, um, you know, there's all these little notes back and forth between us. And that's really, that's really kind of fun that I kept it. I don't, it was surreal. And I was, I was really nervous. I remember being really nervous. And I remember the first thing on the phone that she said to me when the phone was passed to me is, I bet you want to know why I did it. Hmm. And I remember saying, no, I know exactly why you did it. You were 16 years old. And I think you did something amazing. And I remember her saying, you're not mad at me. Huh. And I, I wasn't mad at all. Uh, I thought what she did before I even knew the whole story behind it, I thought it was amazing. And so she and I talked nonstop for the next couple of days. Uh-huh. That was on a Friday night. And on Wednesday is when I flew out to meet her for the first time with uh, a friend of another friend of mine, Kim, I didn't bring at the time my, my ex-husband now, but my, my husband or kids with me. Cause I wanted it just to be able to solely focus on this experience and not, and I didn't know what it was going to look like. Right. As I was going through this process, uh, you know, my adoptive parents shared things with me and it was um, so interesting now compared to then I was, very inexpensive. My adoption was very inexpensive. (laughs) And looking at this, um, I mean, the entire cost from the court cost to the pediatrician for the birth certificates, the hospital, the obstetrician, the lab fee and the attorney fees was a total of $1,570 and 25 cents. Wow. That, that blows my mind because I've seen the costs of an adoption nowadays. Unbelievable. There is Huh. There is the bill. Yeah. So I thought that was kind of fun to uh, to see. To look at the difference between then and now. And now, okay. So everything has changed. Here's a strange, I mean, obviously it's a significant amount more now to adopt a child. Do you think that in a way it is well worth it in that nowadays there's you know, the post-adoption communication agreements to where the child gets to stay in contact. I mean, that's, I think the money sacrifice is well worth the changes that that have come in the recent years with adoption. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. The services provided to birth mothers are unprecedented and unparalleled to what they were. My mother received no counseling. She right. did not have any um, assistance with, you know, maternity clothing or anything. My mother was the third youngest of nine. And my grandmother was a single mom. I mean, they, they weren't living in, you know, a luxury or a mansion. Right. And when I found my birth mother, she had moved back down the street from where I was born because she wanted me to be able to find her more easily. And she literally lived down the street from where the house that she was pregnant with me in, which was again, kind of neat. And the sad part now in, in looking back and, and understanding everything, and especially because she passed away at 59, is that she had looked for me for a long time. Hmm. And, you know, going as far as, you know, filing a claim with, you know, Unsolved Mysteries, they sent her back a letter. And so she gave me the letter that she had sent uh, to Unsolved Mysteries when she was trying to locate me. And that was, that was really sweet. Um, yeah. And that, I mean, obviously they, they didn't help her and it wasn't really an unsolved mystery it was an adoption right right but even that her naivete at the time of thinking well you know robert stack's gonna come out to my house and help me find my baby girl i you know i think that is just sweet it is it is it is it is incredibly sweet and it was it was amazing uh Mm -hmm. So as I had stated at the beginning, and I'm going to try to do this to where you can see, you know, just a couple of the pictures. So 
what I did was I'll hold this back, but what I did was I started off with pictures of, you know, my mother that I had Mm -hmm. when she was, I think about five or six at this time. And then she was in middle school here. She actually resembles my uh, second daughter, Emma, so much that I often will have to like, I'll catch her at an angle and I'll think, oh, wow. Okay. Just like mom. And then, right? yeah. And then her high school uh. pictures. Um, and so what I did was I went through and she had actually written uh, a note to my adoptive mom when I found her. And she sent them a little angel pen and my adoptive mom had kept it. And Hmm. so I put the picture in there just showing how, and she put, dear Lucy, thank you for the pictures. I can't wait to get them. Here's your angel. Um, You were my angel. Thank you. Um, Thank you and your husband with all my heart. You'll always be a part of me. I can't think of what might have happened that way. And you are an angel. Here's your angel pen. So she did that. Mm -hmm. And then when I was born, I, um, my parents were able at that point to pick me up from the hospital at three days old. They, back then they didn't let you come and visit, you know, when the baby was born, it wasn't anything like that. Right. My birth mother did not have the ability to see me or hold me or say goodbye or anything like that. And so, um, that was very hard for her. And that's one of the reasons that I do what I do today, because I don't want anybody else to have that experience. Right. So growing up, I had, you know, a great childhood. <laughs> I was what happy. A cute little and, girl. And, um, you can see that I, we traveled a lot and we did a lot of amazing things. Mm-hmm. And as I was creating this book, I reached out to my adoptive mom and I, I remember telling her, this was maybe a couple of weeks ago and I sent her a copy of the book too. And I said, you know, you guys did a really good job. Thank you. Right. And they did. They did a really good job. And my birth mother did a really good job as well. Now, the next pictures are some pictures I have of my mom and my biological brothers. And, you know, my brothers will tell you that they had a harder, you know, childhood growing up. They didn't have, that's their Christmas picture. Okay. They didn't have, um, you know, the luxuries of being able to travel or you know, not worry about, you know, food and my brother would Finances. say that there were times where they would be hungry. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so I got to go to college and there's, you know, me in college with one of my friends and right. I had, you know, a really happy and fun childhood growing up. And I was so grateful to her. And then to be able to meet her was Amazing. So this is, and I am going to put some of the pictures up on social media. This is Good. when I, the day that I found her. Oh, wow. And that was at the airport. Hmm. So my brother Clarence and my mom came to the airport and that was how happy she was. Wow. And she uh, gave me, the, if you can see the roses, ouch, right there, the roses, she gave me a rose for every year that she had missed my birthday. So oh. that was really sweet. It's getting a little yeah. dusty in here. <laughs> I think there's some I got some and, allergies going on or something. <laughs> so that was uh me with Clarence. Again, mm-hmm. we're still at the airport and then uh yeah, at the airport as I'm getting a rental mm-hmm. car. So as I'm going through this process, you know, people will often say to me, you know, were you sobbing? And I said, No, I was more in shock. I had this frozen smile. <laughs> I I kind of didn't know what to expect. Um, My, my girlfriend that I had brought with me, she, uh, you know, she was so sweet. She left on the drop of, you know, as soon as we found, she has adopted children. She and her husband have adopted kids and they had gone through our agency. And so she really knew a lot about adoption and she was videotaping everything. And so she was sobbing as she is, you know, videoing this, me meeting my mom for the first time. And my mom was crying. And my brother was tearing up and I was just had the frozen smile. Like I didn't know what really to think or to say. Mm -hmm. And my mom has the best sense of humor of anybody that I know. And so she was crying and then she stopped. I remember after she hugged me for a long time and then she stepped back and she looked at me up and down and she said, you're short. (laughs) 
And she wasn't and, a basketball player herself. No, she's shorter than I was. Right. And so <laughs> I, I kind of nodded and, and looked at her. And I didn't really understand her at that point very well because she had a very, very strong uh, West Virginia accent. And even though we had spent a lot of time on the phone, I still had to really pay attention when I was talking with her so that I could focus on what she was saying. Uh -huh. And sometimes I'd have her translate words that she was using, you know, like Davenport. I'd never heard that word. <laughs> I thought it was a last name, right? <laughs> yeah, not a couch on the front porch. Yeah, right. And so I, I would often have to ask her, you know, things, um, you know, like with my medical history, I remember, and, you know, I'm, I'm sharing these things to not, you know, poke fun at what she said, but to show that there is a difference. And even though we, you know, some people may look at it as humor and, and so forth. In some ways it is funny when you understand that there are differences between the way people talk and the way they don't talk. But at the same time, sometimes you really have to try to understand what is being said. So when I was going through my medical history with her, I asked her, you know, things like, what kind of things run in the family? And she said, the sugars. And I, I took a minute and I said, and, and then I realized she's talking, and I said, diabetes. And she said, yes. And, <laughs> and then she had mentioned cholesterol. And I, and I said, oh, so do you watch everything that you eat? And she said, no, I take a little pill every day. And then I eat hot dogs and, and everything else I want. And everything is just fine. I just take, I just take a little pill. Right. So, some of the things that she had shared with me, I, I had to, you know, talk to my doctor about just because I wanted to understand more. And I often had to use descriptive words because I didn't understand. She, she didn't use a lot of medical jargon. Mm -hmm. And so I had to try to put pieces together sometimes to understand where she was coming from. And she had said that she had, uh, after she'd had my second brother, she had had, I guess, a partial hysterectomy. And I said, okay, so can you explain what that means? And she said, um, they took the baby maker out, but left the playpen in. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I don't, I, I'm not going to get this one on my own. And I actually had to go to my OBGYN and ask him, like, what does that mean? And he said, oh, she, they probably took out um, her uterus, but left her ovaries. So that's probably what she was meaning when she was talking about the playpen. So I thought, <laughs> okay. Okay. Like I just didn't, I couldn't wrap my head around like what she meant. Right. And I didn't want to offend her and say like, okay, that makes no sense. Like, what are you, because I wanted to be on her level. I wanted to understand and meet her where she was. Right. I didn't have an expectation of her having to change any aspect of who she was to appease me. I felt like I was stepping back into her world and it was my job to make sure that I met her exactly where she was. Right. And, and here's, here's how I look at it. It's not like looking down on somebody else. It's somebody in a different culture and you're trying to understand mm -hmm. them instead of trying to yeah. bring them to you. And I think yeah. that's how people should be. Right. I was stepping into her world. Mm -hmm. And again, because I wanted to know everything about her, I wanted to make sure that I didn't tamper with the evidence, if you will. I didn't, right. you know, change anything. I wanted to see her how she was. And I was raised in Missouri and Ohio until I was 12. And then in La Jolla, California, until I went off to college. And, you know, we lived in an upper middle class neighborhood and we were an upper middle class family. And that's not the lifestyle that my mother lived in. And so what I found were there were things that were coming very naturally. I mean, I, I could, you know, go into an affluent restaurant and know which fork to use, but at the same time, I was just as comfortable kicking my shoes off, putting them up on the coffee table and, you know, having a blast, you know what I mean? So right. I remember in our reunification, looking at her mannerisms and comparing them to mine and, you know, those kind of things were really fun to discover and how we were similar and how we were different. And that stuff is, is fun when you're an adopted kid and you find somebody that has the same genetics as you, it's almost like opening up a gift because you get to, in some aspects, look in a mirror, but it's a different version of you. And that was really fun. And I remember my, my brother, Clarence, 
months um, when he first talked to me on the phone. And, you know, this is before I even flew out there. And I was trying to explain my, my childhood history. And he was like, oh, well, then do you know Paris Hilton? And I said, no, I have no, I, I have no idea who she is. Yeah, you know, I've seen you her. You live TV, in California. But, um, right. That, yeah, we're on. not neighbors. <laughs> 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 But I found that we both liked horror movies and our favorite show was Little House on the Prairie. And we both had, a, you know, we both actually, all of us don't eat seafood, which mm-hmm. was kind of interesting. Like right. nobody in my biological family will touch seafood. And so there were all these things that were exactly the same. And people who aren't adopted take that stuff for granted. But somebody who is adopted and has grown up without that connection, it is a feeling that is indescribable. And that's what I think is so amazing about adoption reunification. And, you know, one question that I, I get, and I've discussed this pretty openly, is that I don't know at this point who my biological father is. So I only know really half of my story. Whether or not things change in the future, I don't know. But um, I feel so blessed in what I have uncovered and the relationship that I was able to have with my mother for those 10 years and the relationship that I still have with my brothers. And, you know, it was something that I wouldn't change for the world. I wish I would have done it sooner, but maybe that wasn't the time. I don't know. Maybe there was a reason that I waited as long as I did. And I think that everyone is going to have, when you're embarking on a reunification, you have to have the expectation that you need to have no expectation. (laughs) So you don't know what you're getting into. You don't know what the world is going to look like. You know, I was, you know, as a kid, I thought I was going to inherit, you know, a country or be princess something. And that's not the case. And so (laughs) it's it's not yet. It's like, (laughs) <laughs> no, yeah. there's planet fantasy and planet reality and I went to planet reality real fast it was like I was on the jet <laughs> so I I think that my mother was an amazing person and because of her and and because of her choice I have been able to help thousands of people with an adoption plan and it's all because of the choice that she made We have a pregnancy crisis hotline available 24-7 by phone or text at 623-695-4112 or you can reach us on our toll-free number at 1-800-340-9665. We can make an immediate appointment with you to get you to a safe place, provide food and clothing, and help you get started on creating an Arizona adoption plan or just give you more information. Check out our blogs on our website at azpregnancyhelp.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter by looking for AZ Adopt Podcast. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure to rate and review us on whatever platform you use to listen to us. Birth Mother Matters and Adoption was written and produced by Kelly Rourke Scary and edited by me. Thanks go out to Grapes for letting us use their song, I Don't Know, as our theme song. Join us next time on Birth Mother Matters and Adoption. For Kelly Rourke Scary, I'm Ron Rains, and we'll see you then. 